All right. If you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to open them up to James chapter 3. For those of you who've been with us, you know we're in a series titled Real Talk, where we're walking through the book of James. Uh, James is the, the brother of Jesus. He wrote this letter to Christians to challenge them to live out their faith in a very real way. He pulls no punches. He is very in your face. Uh, it's been that way every week. It's going to be that way again today. James chapter 3 is where we're going today, and we're going to pick it up. At verse 1, I'm going to read the the full passage, 1 through 12, and then we're going to kind of walk through it. He starts by saying, Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue is also a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell." All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. All right, let me just pause there for a second. Man, this is intense. Uh, so, so let me just reiterate. He says, the tongue cannot be tamed. No human being can tame the tom- tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison Happy Father's Day, enjoy your cookout, right? Like that's, that's, the, that's the text for today. James is continuing to just challenge us. This is in your face. There's some deep conviction here. But let me just kind of walk through this passage. Let's start where he started. In verse 1 and 2, he says, Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. So this, this introduction here is actually to teachers. It's to people who, who desire to be teachers or to people like me, like a, a leader in the church. Teachers, preachers, pastors, elders, staff members, church leaders. Not many of us should aspire to become teachers because we're going to be held to a, a stricter level of judgment and accountability. And James is calling that out. He, he goes on to say, we all stumble, so let's just recognize that we're all sinners. Chris Freeman is a sinner. You are a sinner. Every single person in this room is a sinner. Every person tuning in online is a sinner. We all stumble in many ways, but there is a, a unique and significant extra accountability that is reserved for those who assume the role of leadership, particularly within the church. This applies to, to the world at large as well, but it's specifically, James is saying, you're going to be held to a stricter judgment, and there's a reason for that. It's because when when we are placed in this role of spiritual authority, when someone like me is in a role of pastor, I'm a teacher. My job right now is to teach the word of God to to literally today hundreds and hundreds of people are hearing the sound of my voice as I unpack the word of God. I do not take this lightly. So let let me just start by saying this. This passage today that I'm teaching on is first and foremost convicting for me. I am not preaching at anybody here. I am preaching what God is already working on in my heart, in my life. There's some deep conviction around this as I teach this today. And this is applicable to me as much as it is to anyone else, actually more so because I'm going to be held to a stricter judgment. But, but this, is, this is important for us to acknowledge that church leaders are held to a higher standard because they have greater authority. They have greater influence. And as the leader goes, so goes the people. That, that's just how this works as the leader. And so, so this isn't just true in the church. I want you to think about this in, in any sphere of life. As the leader goes, so goes the people. So let's just use the example uh, of politics. Over the last five to ten years, I want you to think about the, specifically the rhetoric 
that has transpired over the last five to 10 years, and, and I'm not talking about any particular party here, I'm talking about across the spectrum, and if, let me just say this, if you can't see that it's across the spectrum, then you need some serious heart check, like you need, you need some work to be done in your heart and your mind, you are pretty blinded if you can't see that the rhetoric has just gotten out of control across the spectrum of, of the political leadership, but now I, I want you to think about like, like five years ago, 10 years ago, and then, and then think back to maybe even like 20 years ago or 30 years ago. There are things that are being said today that would never have been acceptable from a leader 10, 20, 30 years ago. And yet that's just normal now. So now, now watch this. Now, now think about how the general public, the general population speaks to one another. And, and the things that we're just now okay with saying and we're comfortable with treating each other in certain ways now. Wh why is that? Because of our leadership. As the leader goes, so goes the people. So this, this is true in every sphere of life, not just in the church, but it's specifically true for the church because at the end of the day, I, like I just want you to know this. I, I do care about you. I care about you. I love you. I care about you. And so in that sense, like I care what you think. I do. But at the end of the day, I care more about what God thinks about what I communicate, what I say, than what you think. And so it doesn't mean that I'm not intentional with my words, that I'm not careful with how I present things. We'll get to that here in a little bit. But at the end of the day, like I, I answer to God, and, and so do all of us. Our words are so powerful. Look at this text again, verse 3. He says, when we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. So he uses a couple of different examples here. A bit in the mouth of the horse, or he talks about uh, a ship and, and how it's you know, large and driven by strong winds, but ultimately they're steered by a very small rudder that takes it wherever the pilot wants to go. And then he says, likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, yet it makes a great boast. So, so your words are incredibly powerful. My words are incredibly powerful, far more powerful than you and I recognize. And that, that's partly because we just happen to live in a, in a time period where, where people just have, uh, they have more words than ever before. We, like, we just talk more than we ever have before. And we have the ability to talk and share our words far greater than we ever have been able to do so before. Not just verbally, but, but electronically and elsewhere. Like, we, we just are constantly speaking and consuming words, like all the time. Nobody is bored anymore. Like you are constantly filling your mind with words and then speaking those words all of the, all of the time. And, and, and we don't recognize just how powerful those words are. But according to the text, your words will actually guide and steer the direction of your life. I, I don't know if you caught that or not. But what, what James is saying, he compares this to a bit in the mouth of the horse or a rudder on a ship in the same way that those things steer a, a large animal, a large boat, your words, your tongue will direct and steer the course of your life. Your words are far more powerful than you realize. And so I, I want to give you a few examples. I, I want to make sure you hear me, though. I'm, I'm not talking about, like, manifesting, okay? Like, that's, I know that's, like, a new trend. Like, I'm just going to manifest. I'm going to say something. I'm going to speak something into existence, and then it's just going to happen, right? So I'm just going to speak that, you know, I'm a millionaire, and I don't have to work anymore. And, and let me just ask you, how's that working for you? I don't think so, okay? That's nonsense. That's a whole other category for another day. What I'm talking about is the words that you speak and the influence they have on your life and how they take you and lead you and guide you in a certain direction. So here are just a few examples. Um, some of you probably heard people say this. Maybe some of you have said this about yourself. But, but uh, the phrase that we've all heard somebody say before is, I'm, I'm just not good at math. How many of you have heard somebody say that? I'm just not good at math. Maybe, maybe some of you feel that about yourself. I'm just not good at math. And here's the reality. Like the more you say, I'm just not good at math, the more you convince yourself that you're not good at math and then you're not going to try to be good at math and then eventually you won't be good at math. And so, so we've all heard kids say this. I actually heard my own daughter say this at one point a couple years ago. She said, I'm just not good at math. And when she said that, she was literally working on two grade levels up level of math. And she was having a difficult time with it because it was challenging. And so she used the phrase, I'm just not good at math. And I had to correct that for her right then and there and say, no, no, you are very good at math. And you're going to repeat this after me. Say, I am good at math. And she had to say, I am good at math. That's one example, but, we, but we've all seen that play out, that somebody says, I'm not good at it, and then eventually they, they believe that, and then that becomes true for them. Or how about this one? You've heard somebody say, I, I'll, I'll never go to college. I'll never go to college. 
And, and let me be clear, I'm not elevating college as more important than other career paths. I, I don't think it is. I, I think there are lots of great opportunities in, in our world today, and college is one of them. But if, if you just convince yourself, your whole like, like my, my family, we just don't do that. We, we don't go to college. I don't go to college. That's just not, not who I am. I'll never go to college. I don't have what it takes to go to college. Then eventually you will find yourself never going to college. Or how about this one? How many of you have ever found yourself, we'll just, we'll just be honest here. How many of you have ever said, I just, I hate running. I hate running. Just raise your hand. How many of you have said that? I, we all know Corey Hooley hates running. Clearly that guy, he doesn't even know how to run. Legs slapping together. <laughs> Still, just can't get over that. But the phrase, I hate running. If you say, I hate running, then guess what? You will hate running. And I'm not trying to convince you that we all need to become runners here. That's not the goal. But, but maybe in a more broad uh, way to say it is just, I, I hate exercise. If you say, I hate exercise, I just can't stand exercise, I hate exercise, then eventually you will hate exercising. And you won't exercise and you won't take care of yourself. So the words that you use, they steer the course of your life. Or maybe on a little more of a serious and, and weighty note, I, I know we've all heard people who've said phrases like this, I can never be loved. I can never be loved. You don't know my story. You don't know my past. I can never be loved. And, and, and maybe there's some people in here today and you've, you legitimately feel like that and you've told yourself that. Maybe you've never said it out loud, but you've told yourself in your heart and in your mind, I could never be loved. You've believed a lie about yourself. And maybe it has to do with some, some traumatic experiences you've had in your life or some, some form of abandonment, maybe even from a parental figure in your life you've been hurt by. And so then, then somehow along the way, you just started to convince yourself, I'm unlovable and I can never be loved. And ultimately what happens is you end up building up these walls to, to protect yourself and to preserve your own life. You build up these walls and you reject all forms of love in your life. Our words direct the course of our life. Or this one, this one's a little more uh, lighthearted and this one's just, you know, for me. But how many of us have ever heard somebody say, you know, the Dallas Cowboys will never win another Super Bowl again, you know? Amen. This year's our year. That's why you hear every year you hear me say that. You got to hear me say every year, this year's our year. I just keep telling myself that, right? Okay, let's be honest, I have no impact on whether or not the Dallas Cowboys win a Super Bowl. That's a little, little ridiculous. But for the rest of those examples, the words that you speak will direct the course of your life and they will have an impact on other people's lives. So be careful with the words that you speak to other people. Because in the same way that the words that you speak about yourself impact the, the direction of your life, they steer you, the words that you speak to other people will steer them as well. And so, so not only are our words powerful, but man, we have a whole lot of them. The average person, average person, according to one study, speaks 16,000 words a day. 16,000 words a day. I, I, some of you may recall me sharing this from a message a couple of years ago. It's starting to sound a little bit familiar. It's because I went back and listened to that message and it was really good. And so I was like, I'm going to reuse a lot of that content today. So there you go. Happy Father's Day. Be blessed. 16,000 words a day. That's, that's kind of mind blowing. And so over the course of a week then, that's enough words to fill a 400 page book. Like that, that's the amount of words the average person speaks. Like four, 400 pages a week, every week of your life. So in the last year alone, you have filled more than 50 of, of these books, more than 50 of them, with the words that you speak. That's just the average person. And here's the reality. Once you speak those words, you cannot get them back. They are in print. They, they, are, they are there forever. And th those are just the words you speak, not the words you write, not the words you tweet, not the words that you text. Not the words that you think, but don't say. Those are just the words you speak, the average person. And I will tell you, I believe I am above average when it comes to the amount of words that I speak. Here's how I know that. Every week, my sermons, they average about 10,000 words just in one sermon. Like, I'm up here for less than an hour, and I speak 10,000 words. That's a little ridiculous. I do it twice on Sunday, so I get 20,000 words in two services on a Sunday morning. I'm filling a whole lot of books with a whole lot of words. We speak a lot of words, and our words are very, very powerful. Not only are they powerful, but they also have the potential to be incredibly destructive. Remember what James says. Likewise, verse 5, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue is also a fire. A world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by 
hell. Your words have the potential to be incredibly destructive. Incredibly destructive. And if we aren't careful, they will be. Every single one of us. I, I don't have to convince you of this. We all know, we've all experienced it. Every single one of us is, have experienced exactly what I'm talking about. Right now, every person in this room, every person listening online, you can think of a time where somebody said some words to you and you still remember those words and they still sting to this day. Like, like, like they still hurt. They're just some words, some phrases, that, and, and, and chances are it came from someone that you love and somebody that, that you care about. Every single one of us can remember that. And at the same time, every single one of us in here, if we think about it, we can remember a time where somebody spoke a word into our life, spoke some encouragement into us that brought us such joy, such hope, and it was just such a timely word that we can still remember exactly what they said to this very day. I know I've shared this with you before, but I can remember when I was at a, at a camp out with a bunch of other kids and, a, and a, one of the leaders of the camp out said, is anybody willing to pray over the food that we're about to eat? And I just volunteered, said, yeah, I'm sure I, I will, I'll pray. And then I prayed and that leader came over after that prayer and he just pulled me aside and he spoke directly into my life and he said, hey, I just wanna let you know, I believe God told me you're gonna be a pastor one day. I mean, I'm just a little kid. I said, well, why do you believe that? He said, any kid that just volunteered to pray like that in front of other people, God's got a, an anointing on your life. And I believe you're going to be a pastor one day. I still remember those words. Every single one of us can remember the words that people have spoken into our life that have filled us with encouragement and blessing and joy. And at the same time, every single one of us, myself included, in this room, we can remember a time where we have spoken words that we still regret to this day. We can remember exactly what we said, exactly who we said it to, why we said it. And we so wish we could take those words back out of that book. And we can't. And at the same time, every single one of us in here, we can remember times where, where, man, it just, the hand of God was upon us and he gave us, by the power of his Holy Spirit, the right words and the right courage, the right timing to just speak directly into somebody else's life in a way that was so life-giving for them. And we are so thankful for those moments in our lives. Your words are powerful. They're so powerful. And they have the ability to be life-giving or life-destroying. Look, look, at, look at verse 9 with me again. He says, With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. I want to draw your attention to this. Do not miss it. He doesn't say, With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse our brothers and sisters in Christ. He says we curse human beings, period. And then he reminds us that all human beings, including the people that you don't like and the people that don't like you, including the people that, that, that don't believe the same way that, that you do, that don't share the same values that you share, that don't live the same way you live, that don't think the same way that you think, even the people that, that you can't stand or they can't stand you, all of them have been made in the image of God. They're made in the image of God. And with the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse human beings, both believers and not, who've been made in God's likeness. He's drawing us back to the creation account there. He's reminding us that this is God's design. There's something unique about human beings. There's something unique about you. You are different than all of the rest of creation. That God made you in his image. This is who you are. You are made in the image of God. And that's not only who you are, that's who every other person on this planet is. It's a person who has been made in the image of God. Verse 10, out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? He gives these examples saying like, this is, this is impossible. This is absurd. Can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? This is not who you are. That's not who you were created to be. You, you have been redeemed. You have been bought at a price. You belong to Christ. You have been made a new creation. You praise your heavenly father. There should be no cursing for anyone that comes out of your mouth toward the people that he has made in his image. You see, the reality is for all of us, every person here, we all have what I would call an us, and we all have a them. Every one of us, we have an us and we have a them. And the us is the people who look like us or think like us or vote like us or believe like us or behave like us 
or, or have the same values that we have, who are in agreement with us. That's the us. And we've got a lot of different ways that we all have an us. And then we all have a them. And, and the reality is, for everybody in here, your us and your them is going to be a little different. But we all have a them as well. And, and the them is people who do not think like us, who don't vote like us, who don't believe like us, who don't behave like us, who don't share the same values that we have, don't share the same faith that we have. We all have an us and we all have a them. And here's the reality. It is so easy to love the people who live like us. And it is so much harder to live this text out when it comes to the people who fall into the camp of them, whoever your them is. But according to the text here, according to the text, there is no us and them in the eyes of God. Because all human beings were made in, in the image of God, every single one of them, made in his image and his likeness. They are cherished. God sent, listen to me, he sent his son Jesus to die for the person that you disagree with the most, that, that you have the most difficulty with, that you are the most opposed to, he sent his son to die for them just as much as he sent his son to die for you and for me. And so then the question is, what do we do? Like the way James kind of wraps this up, all, all, you know, all animals, birds, reptiles, sea creatures, they've all been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil, full of deadly poison. God bless, amen, good luck. Have a great week, right? Is that how we wrap it up today? What do we do? How do we, how do we get this under control? Because what, what does he say at the beginning? We all stumble in many ways. Remember, we're all sinners, but anyone who is never at fault in what they say, they're perfect. They're able to keep their whole body in check. So if we can get this part figured out, if we can get the tongue, the words that we speak figured out, then everything else will fall into line. Your, your, your words will direct the course of your life. So I, I want to make this as helpful and as practical as possible. The book of James is such a practical book. I want to make this as helpful and practice, practical as possible. And so I'm going to share four, four things that I, I think are really, really important for us. I want to encourage you to write these things down as we live this out. Number one would be this, to check your heart. Check your heart. Matthew uh, chapter 12. I referenced this passage a couple weeks ago, but I'm going to unpack it for us here a little bit today. So this passage is in the context of Jesus being criticized by the Pharisees after uh, he performs a miracle, heals a man, and, and then the religious leaders start accusing Jesus of driving out demons by the power of demons. And so Jesus has this back and forth with them and, and corrects them on that. And then this is what he says is the conclusion of that conversation. So remember, this is a conversation with religious leaders who are supposed to know God best. This is what he says. Matthew 12, verse 33. Make a tree good and its fruit will be good. Or make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad. For a tree is recognized by its fruit. You brood of vipers. Pause for a moment. Anytime Jesus calls you a brood of vipers, stop doing what you're doing and do the opposite, just in general, okay? Or anytime you're reading scripture and you're like, oh yeah, I really resonate with those people, and then Jesus calls them a brood of vipers, don't resonate with those people anymore. Like, just avoid it at all costs. You brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? Listen to this, for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. But I tell you that everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. So this is why we have to start with the heart. I don't know if you caught that, but Jesus said, for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. So, so I'll, I'll say it like this. Your, your words are, are the fruit. Your heart is the root. Your heart is the root. And so, yeah, we, we see the fruit, right? We get, to, we get to see and hear the fruit, and that's our words, the things that we say. But those words that we speak are really just a product of what's deeply rooted within our hearts. And so if all you're doing is trying to correct your words, then James is exactly right. Like, we'll never be able to tame the tongue. But if we can allow God to do the necessary heart work in us to reveal why we're saying those words, then we can have our hearts 
clean, purified, and made new, and our words will flow out of that as well. Your words are the fruit. Your heart is the root. And so here's what I mean when I say check your heart. Invite the Holy Spirit to examine your heart and to reveal to you any and all areas where you still need healing and and transformation. Invite him to expose areas of sin that are deeply rooted within your heart that maybe you have a blind spot to. Maybe you don't even recognize it. Maybe you're not aware of it. Invite the Holy Spirit in on that and let him reveal to you the areas where, where you, still, you still need to surrender that sin over to him and let him transform you and change you and invite him to reveal areas where maybe it's not a sin issue, maybe it's a deep-rooted hurt or pain issue in your life that has not been exposed because you've been guarded, because you're afraid, and so he hasn't been able to heal it because God can't heal what you won't reveal. And so invite him to, to, just to examine your heart and to reveal that to you in order to bring healing in your life. Remember, the Holy Spirit is your helper. He's your helper. God sent him to help you. He wants to help you. He's not here to condemn you. So when I say invite the Holy Spirit to examine your heart, it's not to judge you. It's not to condemn you. The Holy Spirit is here to help you, to lead you into paths of righteousness, to to transform your heart and your life. He wants to do a good work in you, and he is gentle and humble and kind and merciful and compassionate. So invite the Holy Spirit into that process. And then when you do that, Here's the hard part. Listen. Like we, we just have so many words. We're speaking all the time and we're consuming information all the time. We're hearing other people's words all the time. There's so much noise that it's drowning out the, the voice of God himself. That still small voice where God wants to simply speak to your life and show you. There's, and there's still some sin here that he wants to remove from your life. He wants to liberate you from. He wants to free you from. And there's still some some hurt here and some pain in your heart that he wants to heal you and, and lead you to a new life where you're free from that hurt and free from that pain. Invite the Holy Spirit in. So maybe just a couple examples of this. One would be if, if you're somebody who is constantly critical of others. Like, like if you just find yourself, the words that you're speaking are always just hypercritical. We've all been around people like that, where, where your words are just like the first, the first response, first reaction out of your mouth is just to be critical of somebody else, hypercritical of other people. In my experience, I, I just want to speak pastorally here for a moment. I've spent a lot of time with people over the, the years that I've been doing this, and I've heard a lot of people's stories and a lot of people's hurts and a lot of people's pain, and I've walked through a lot of issues with people, and, and over time, you start to see patterns that play out. And so if you're somebody who is hypercritical of other people, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying this is 100% true all the time, but there is a very good chance that you have some very deeply rooted self-hatred with inside of you. And the reason why you're so hypercritical of everyone else is because you're trying to avoid the fact that you actually have some hatred toward your own self. And the way you deal with that is instead being hate, hateful and critical of other people. And if you're not willing to let the Holy Spirit reveal that and then heal that in your life, then you're going to continue to find yourself being hypercritical of other people. And then you get frustrated and then you just beat yourself up because you said the things that you wish you wouldn't have said and you regret it and then you repeat the process over and over and it's an endless cycle. That's the power of the tongue to be destructive in our lives. So this is why we check our heart. Listen, you you can't love your neighbor as yourself if you hate yourself That's just the reality. Like you can't, you cannot love your neighbor as yourself if you hate yourself. If if you have a deep self-hatred, if you have believed the lies of the enemy, that you are unlovable, that you are unworthy, that you should hate yourself, then you will not be able to love your neighbor as yourself because you don't even love yourself. And so if that's that's you, I, I just want to encourage you, like invite the Holy Spirit in. Or maybe another example is if you're somebody who is always putting other people down or trying to brag about yourself. You know, you know the person I'm talking about, like the, the, they're always playing that one-up game. Like no matter what you did, they did a little bit better. You know what I'm talking about? Like in whatever area of life. 
If that's you and you find yourself always playing that game where you're always trying to impress other people by either putting them down or, or, or making yourself look better, then there's a very good chance that that comes from a deep-rooted insecurity in your own life and a deep-rooted insecurity in who you are and your identity in Christ. And so therefore, you, you spend all of your time trying to prove yourself to everyone else in the world. And therefore, the way you do that is by bragging about yourself or putting other people down. Because once you know who you are, once you know your identity in Christ, once you know that you are secure in Christ, then listen, you don't, you don't have to prove anything to anybody. There's so much freedom there. So this starts with checking your heart. Number two would be this, analyze the data. Analyze the data. Kevin Butler, I know you appreciate that point. Kevin loves spreadsheets. Analyze the data. Kevin Butler's going to be preaching here next week as well, so maybe he'll share some spreadsheets. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29 through 32. Let me read this for you, and then I'll unpack what I mean by analyze the data. This is Paul writing to the church in Ephesus. He says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. Ouch. Like, I, mean, I could have just preached that part of that verse today. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. This isn't a suggestion. This isn't like, hey, if you, if you feel like it, this could be a good idea. This is the word of God for us. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So I, I don't know if you're catching this or not, but James and Paul are saying the same thing here. Pa Paul, in, in context of talking about how we treat one another, says you you, you do recognize that if you're not building each other up, if you're, if you're talking down to one another, if you're cursing one another in various ways, then you're actually grieving the Holy Spirit of God. James says that when, when we treat those who are made in the image of God, un, unlike they were made in the image of God, that we're actually hurting our relationship with God as well. They're saying the exact same thing here. Verse 31, get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. I love that the word of God always brings it back to the why. Like, why are we doing all this? Because remember, remember who you were apart from Christ? And remember what God did for you? This is why we do this. And I also love that in this letter written to a church, remember this is Ephesians, written to the church in Ephesus. Like I'm, I'm always so encouraged when I read scripture because I'll just be honest with you, like city church, we're a bit of a hot mess. We just are. Like if you're new here, welcome. It's messy. Like real messy. It gets real messy real quick. And I'm, I'm my own mess. And so sometimes like I, I can, you know, even, even me, I can feel a little insecure about that until I read the scriptures and I'm like, oh, that's right. Paul had to write to a church and tell them, stop brawling, please. Like, it, it would be great if you would stop getting in fist fights before and after service. Like, that would be like your next step of obedience is to not punch your neighbor in the face. Like, that was their instruction. Like, it's, the church has always been a mess, okay? Can we all just agree with that? Like, it, it's always been a mess. There is one perfect one. His name is Jesus, and we are just a mess being saved and redeemed by him. But I don't know if you caught this. When he tells us not to let any unwholesome talk come out of our mouths, he says, that instead, this is what it sh should be. Only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs. So when I say analyze the data, here's what I mean evaluate and examine the results of the words that you're speaking. Not, not based off of how you feel about them. Well, not, not based off of what you meant. This, that's what I meant. This, this is how I meant it. Only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, not what you think, but what they need, that it may benefit those who listen. So analyze it. Here's, here's an easy way to do that, particularly when it comes to the people that you're in closest relationship with, the people that you spend the most amount of time with, which generally are, are the people that you, you love the most. Ask yourself, are your words actually building them up? And the way, the way you can evaluate that is, do you see them 
becoming a better version of themselves? And, and honestly, like, do you see them growing closer to Christ because of the words that you're speaking into their life or not? Like, look at, look at the impact of your words on the people around you. If you're married, look at the impact of your words on your spouse. Like, like I'm just going to get real here for a moment. From time to time, when I'll sit down with people and their marriage is in a really broken place, and one spouse will just, you know, start rattling off all the problems and all the issues they have with their spouse and how their spouse is, you know, mean and difficult and challenging and all those sorts of things. And I'll ask them, like, how long you've been married? And sometimes it's 10, 15, 20 years. And I'll be like, well, you got a, you got a part to play in this then. Maybe they weren't, like, when, I doubt when you met them and you fell in love with them, you said, man, I just love how mean they are. I love how difficult they are. What's the impact of the words that you're speaking on your spouse? Your words are far more powerful than you realize. Far more powerful. So speak life into your spouse. If you you feel like your spouse is a difficult person, chances are you have a part to play in that. So start speaking life into them. Analyze the data. When it comes to your kids, if you have children... Analyze the data. Do you see your children growing into the people that you you hope they become? And then ask yourself, are you speaking the words that help them to become that person? And, And now, let me be clear. I'm not saying that everybody else's life is your personal responsibility. We all have personal responsibility here. But you have a lot of power with your words. So for those of you who are leaders... Maybe, maybe you're an employer, employer or you, you're a manager, you own a business, or you, or you lead a group of people in your company. Are the people that you're leading and pouring into, do you see them becoming the type of person that you, you want to work for you? Or do you find yourself complaining all the time that you just can't find good help? At some point, that's on you. Like, if you're a leader in your organization, whatever level of leadership you have, the culture that's underneath of you is a direct result of your leadership. As the leader goes, so goes the people. So are the words you're speaking, analyze the data. Are they building others up? Are they tearing them down? Are they giving life? Are they destroying life? And and for, for everybody in here, when it comes to just... Your sphere of influence, your peers, your coworkers, you still have an incredible amount of influence. The people that you're closest to, if you have a job, man, you spend more time with those people than just about anybody else in your life. So what's the impact? If you're a follower of Jesus, and the amount of time you've spent with those people, do you see them, because of your influence, becoming more Christ-like or not? Analyze the data. And then number three would be season with salt. Look at Colossians now with me. Colossians chapter 4. We're going to just look at a couple verses here. Verses 5 and 6. Paul again writes, Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Everybody say outsiders. Outsiders. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders, making the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace. Say full of grace. grace. Seasoned with salt. Say seasoned with salt so that you may know how to answer everyone. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. So when Paul's talking about outsiders, he's talking about people who are outside of the family of faith, people who don't know Jesus. Be wise in the way that you act toward outsiders. Making the most of every opportunity. Can I just remind you, like, like there are a whole lot of people who don't know Jesus And they are created in the image of God. And Jesus died on the cross for them. And he desperately wants a relationship with them. And you may be the only Bible they ever read. And how you treat them and how you interact with them and how you talk to them, how you talk about them. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders, making the most of every opportunity. So this is just a good time for me to remind us, we are not, brothers and sisters, Christians, followers of Jesus, we are not fighting a culture war. We're not, and we need to stop trying to fight a culture war. We're we're taking the battle far too low when we try to fight a culture war. The war is not a cultural one. It is a spiritual war. And so we need to be fighting a spiritual battle, not a cultural battle, meaning your enemy is not flesh and blood. It is a, it is a, a principalities and powers. It is in the spiritual realm. And so rather than arguing with people, spend more time praying for them than you do arguing with them. 
Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Maybe a simple way to summarize that statement would be, when you act like a jerk, you lose your influence. And you lose your witness. So let me, let me just ask you this. Like, if you were to be honest and evaluate the way Christians talk, specifically the way Christians talk about people they disagree with, versus the way the world talks about people they disagree with, is there any difference? And now I'm going to make it a little more personal. Like, when you talk about people you disagree with, when you talk to people you disagree with versus the way people who don't know Jesus do that, is there any real difference? Because at the end of the day, if, if the only difference is your beliefs are different than theirs, but it ultimately ends up in a whole bunch of hatred and, and judgment and, and, and literally cursing one another, then why would somebody who doesn't know Jesus want anything to do with that? We are not going to be able to, to lead people into a life-changing, life-saving relationship with Jesus through behavior modification. And, and far too often, that is our approach. We, we want to change people's behaviors before God's had the opportunity to actually change their heart. We should be pursuing their heart and letting God do the hard work of changing their, them from the inside out that ultimately changes their behaviors. Remember, your words are the fruit. Your behaviors are the fruit. Your heart is the root. We want to let God change their heart. And so, so the reason why I say that number three is seasoned with salt is right out of the text here. Your conversations with both believers but especially non-believers should always be full of grace and seasoned with salt. They should be marked by those two things. And so if, if you're evaluating the way you interact with or the way you think about, the way you believe, the way you operate toward non-believers, toward outsiders, if it is not full of grace and seasoned with salt, then you're missing it. So full of grace means that, that you're just, you're going to assume the best. You're going to believe the best. You're going to be incredibly charitable toward that person. You're going to be kind and compassionate. You're going to operate differently than the way the rest of the world does. You're going to listen well. You're not going to argue to prove a point. Because at the end of the day, like I think far too many of us care more about making a point than actually making a difference in somebody's life. And so, so we're going to be kind. We're going to be full of grace. And then we're going to be seasoned with salt. Let me just unpack that a little bit for you in case you don't get it. Because I know some of y'all ain't putting any salt on your food. And I'm not coming to your house because of that. I, I'm going to leave that alone. Seasoned with salt means it's more palatable. It means it adds a little flavor to it. It means it's a little more thoughtful. Like, can you imagine if, if the response from Christians was like, we're just going to be a little more thoughtful. A little more thoughtful than the rest of the world. I mean, a little slower to speak. We're going to be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to get angry. You, have you ever heard somebody who's, who just like, their MO is to always be like, I just tell it like it is. That's just who I am. I just tell it like it is. Well, how's that working for you? Just telling it like it is. Like as Christians, I, I don't think that that should be our, our mode of operation. To just tell it like it is. Because the text says, no, 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 it should be full of grace and seasoned with salt. Telling it like it is, ultimately what that means is I just really don't care about the impact of my words. I just want to say it to say it. Like be a little more thoughtful in the way you approach things. Season it with salt. Be more palatable. Be a little more interesting. Be a little more enjoyable in the conversation. Make, make those conversations more desirable, that, that somebody would look at the way you treat outsiders, and even if they aren't a follower of Jesus, they would look and they would say, man, like even when people come after them, man, even when people say hurtful things to them, the way that they respond, the way that they engage, the way they lean in, the way they're so full of grace, even for the, their strongest opponents, there's something so captivating and compelling about that. Your conversations want to be full of grace and seasoned with salt. So we're going to check our heart. We're going to analyze the data. We're going to season with salt. And then number four, and finally, we're going to speak the truth. We're going to speak the truth. And, and I want to be clear. I, I do believe we need to speak the truth. We need to speak the truth in love. I believe the world is desperate for the truth. 
I don't think we need to punch people in the face with truth. I don't think we need to tell it like it is. I think we need to be full of grace, seasoned with salt, always prepared to give an answer for why we believe what we believe, ready and prepared to have those conversations. But we do need to speak the truth. But before you can speak the truth to other people, this is really where I want to press in today. You need to speak the truth to yourself. Like you, you need to speak the truth to yourself. See, far too many of us, even as Christians, we, we're still believing some lies. I, I, I gave some examples earlier, but I know there are some people in this room who, man, you're like, you're still believing. There are people who probably still believe that you are unlovable. That you will never be loved. And I'm, I'm just here to tell you, that's a lie from the pit of hell. And so the way that we speak the truth, remember, you, you're, you're printing one of these a week with your words. So, so then the, the way that we speak the truth is we make sure that, that we're consumed by this one and that our words are filled with this word and that we're continually going back to the word of God and that we're saturating ourselves in the word of God so that we know it so well that it just flows out of our mouths and, and we speak the truth and proclaim the truth of the word of God over our own lives and we, we start to understand who we really are. And so I just want to share just some scriptures and speak the truth of God over each and every one of us here in this place. This comes out of a, a book from Neil Anderson called Who I Am in Christ. It's a, such a powerful book, but this, this is just scripture, it's just a list of scripture. I have this in my office. I read this at least once a week and just proclaim these truths over my own life. And I'm going to do it over, over our lives here as well today. John uh, chapter one, verse 12 says that you are a child of God. John 15, 15 says, as a disciple, you are a friend of Jesus Christ. Romans 5, 1 says that you have been justified and declared righteous. Romans 6, 17 says that you have been united with the Lord and you are one with him in spirit. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19 and 20 says, I have been bought with a price. You have been bought with a price and you belong to God. So let me just, just clarify really quickly. You have been bought with a price. You are loved. You are loved enough that Jesus would die on a cross for you. He would give his life for you because he loves you that much. You have been bought at a price and you belong to Christ. You have been chosen. Ephesians uh, verses, uh, chapter 1 verses 3 through 8 says you have been chosen by God and adopted as his child. So I don't care what your relationship is with your, heavenly, or with your earthly father. You have a perfect relationship with your heavenly father. You have been adopted into his family as his child. Colossians 1, 13 and 14. 14 says, you have been redeemed and forgiven of all your sins. So if you're convincing yourself you're unlovable because of your past, it's been washed away and you need to proclaim and declare and speak the truth of the word of God over your own life. Colossians 2 verses 9 and 10 says, you are complete in Christ. You are lacking nothing. You don't have to prove anything to anybody. You have everything you need in Jesus Christ. Hebrews 4 verses 14 through 16 says that you have direct access to the throne of grace through Jesus Christ. I don't know if you recognize that or not, but the throne of God, the way he describes his own throne is that it is a throne of grace. You can go before him at any time for any reason whatsoever. You have direct access to him. Romans 8 verses 1 and 2 says that you are free from condemnation. Romans 8 28 says that you are assured that God works for your good in all circumstances. So you may find yourself right now in a circumstance where you feel like there is no good that can come from this and you have to proclaim the truth of the word of God that he works for your good in all situations. Roman 8, Romans 8 verses 31 through 39 says, you are free from condemnation brought against you and you cannot be separated from the love of God. There is nothing that can separate you from his love. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verses 21 and 22 says, you have been established, anointed, and sealed by God himself. We just talked about that. You have been sealed by the Holy Spirit. Colossians chapter 3 Verses one through four says, I am hidden with Christ in God. You have been hidden. You have been protected. You are covered. You have his shelter. He will be with you forever. He will never leave you. He will never abandon you. Philippians chapter one, verse six says that you are confident that God will complete the good work he has started in you. So if you're looking at yourself right now and you're saying, man, I, I feel like I'm still a little bit of a mess. I feel like I don't have it all figured out. I feel like I still have work to do. Then praise God because he's not done with you yet. And he will carry that work on to completion. 
citizen. Philippians chapter 3 verse 20 says that you are a citizen of heaven. That is your eternal residence, a citizen of heaven. You belong to the kingdom of God. 2 Timothy verse 1, uh, chapter 1 verse 7 says that you have not been given a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. So if you are finding yourself in this place where you fear, feel fearful and you're unsure and you're uncertain, then listen, rebuke the lies of the enemy and proclaim the truth of God over your life that you have the spirit of power and love and a sound mind. And if the same spirit of God who is alive in you is the same spirit who raised Jesus from the dead, imagine what he can do in your life. First John verse five, uh, chapter five, verse 18 says that you are born of God and the evil one, listen to this, cannot touch you. He has no authority over your life. He cannot touch you, so proclaim the word of God over your life. If you feel like he's attacking you, go back to the word and speak the truth over your own life. John 15 verse 5 says that you are a branch of Jesus Christ, the true vine, and a channel of his life. You have been engrafted in. John 15 16 says that you have been chosen and appointed to bear fruit. Remember, he is doing an inner work in you so that he can bear good fruit in your life. 1 Corinthians 3 16 says that you are God's temple. I don't know if you recognize that or not, but the, the God that created the universe resides within you. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians 5 verses 17 through 21 says, I am a minister of reconciliation for God. I don't know if you recognize that either, but each and every one of us are ministers, not just me, but all of us. And we have been given the ministry of reconciliation, of reaching outsiders and bringing them into the family of God. That is what you have been called and equipped to do. Ephesians 2, 6, this one blows my mind every time I read it. You are seated with Christ Jesus in the heavenly realms right now. So yes, Chris Freeman right now, body, soul, spirit, right here with you in person and yet at the same time I am seated with Christ Jesus in the heavenly realms and the same thing is true about each and every one of you. Ephesians 2.10 says you are God's workmanship. You are his masterpiece. You are his very best work. Ephesians 3.12 says that you can approach God with freedom and confidence. You do not have to fear and Philippians 4.13 says that you can do all things. All things including difficult things, including challenging things. You can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. Amen. Amen. Proclaim the truth, speak the truth, declare the truth of the word of God over your life. Wash yourself in the word. And watch the words that come out of your mouth start to change in ways that you never imagined. And all of a sudden you start speaking life, not just over yourself, but over other people. And, and you will see those words become so powerful in such life-giving ways. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your word. We thank you for this letter from James. We thank you for the, the reminder that, that our words are powerful and they will direct the course of our life. Most importantly, God, we thank you that you get the final word and that you have already spoken a word over us that we cannot change. So we just receive that today. Jesus, you are the living word. We thank you that you have given us new life in you. So God, I pray for every person in this place today that you would help us to truly and genuinely check our hearts, to, to allow you, Holy Spirit, to examine our hearts and reveal areas of sin and areas of hurt that need to be transformed and healed. God, I pray that you would help us to, to evaluate the impact of our words on the people around us. I pray that you would enable us by the power of your Holy Spirit to season our words with salt, that our conversations, especially with outsiders, would be full of grace and seasoned with salt. And finally, God, I pray that you would help us to speak the truth of your word over our own lives and then over the lives of those around us. Continue to, to work in our, in our lives as we go from this place. Move in a mighty way. Holy Spirit, have your way continue to, to minister to us and minister through us. We love you and we pray this all in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. amen.